Viewer discretion is advised. From a young age, he battled same-sex attraction and transgenderism. But today, he shares his testimony, telling people everywhere about what Jesus has done in his life. He's Michael Carducci, I'm John Bradshaw, and this is Our Conversation. Michael Carducci, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate it. Yeah. Now, listen, you've got quite a story. But before we start telling that story, let's go back to the beginning and find out who Michael Carducci is. Where'd you grow up? Where are you from? Well, my dad was in the Navy, so we moved a lot of places. I was born in Charleston, South Carolina, but we lived in Virginia, Michigan, Ohio, Florida, Tennessee. Yeah, so we've been around. I went to 10 schools in my 12 years of early education. Oh, yeah. Okay, you did get around. Sure. Mm -hmm. So when you were a kid, what were you going to be when you grew up? Um, I don't know. I think I think everything was such a blur. I ended up going to school when I was five years old to first grade. I think I was probably trouble at home, and my mom was probably anxious to get me out. But um, yeah, that was kind of elusive to me. You know, even through even when I went to college, I wasn't even sure what my major was going to be. Today, you're involved in ministry, dealing with or talking about homosexuality, transgenderism, and those mm-hmm. kinds of issues. Talk to me about your journey into a gay lifestyle and your, your I don't want to call it your battle, but I'll call it that, your battle with transgenderism. Sure. Where'd this come from? I would like to know too. Um, so what well, was your home life like? Was, was it any reflection on your home life? Yes. And at 40 years old, when I was baptized the second time coming into the Adventist church, um, I had two questions for Jesus. That was it. It wasn't about the Sabbath or the state of the dead. The questions that I had for Jesus is I wanted to know why at my very first conscious thought, probably about four years old, I wanted to know why I was a girl trapped in a boy's body. That's interesting. And that followed me until I was 20 years old. And then at 13, um, when puberty came, my attractions uh, ended up going towards the same sex. So at 40 years old, coming back into a relationship with Jesus Christ after living 20 years in the gay culture, those were my two questions. I want to know why I was trans at four, and I want to know why I was gay at 13. Did you ever get answers to those questions? Satisfactory? Well, not from the church. And unfortunately, there wasn't any resources that I could really glean um, you know, from the church or the denomination. But you know what? Jesus was faithful to me, sure. and it was in a process of about seven years that he took me on a journey of understanding that there was science involved, there was uh, relationships involved. Um, The Bible also helped me as well as Spirit of Prophecy on that journey because it wasn't just um, homosexuality and transgenderism that I dealt with. After going into the gay culture, I also struggled with sexual addiction and pornography addiction. Um, So as a new new babe in in the church, um, there was a lot of struggles that I had for a period of time before I found those um, victories. Some interesting questions arise out of what you're talking about. You were gay, yes? Yes. You're not gay now? No. Uh, But that flies in the face of everything that we hear in the media, that kind can never change, born gay, once gay, always gay. Evidently, your life testifies to the fact that that's not true. Well, it's interesting because I would like to clarify, and God didn't take away my history or my memory and the fact that I lived in that culture for 20 years and I was in, you know, five significant relationships while I was in that culture. So I still have those memories and those thoughts. And so God doesn't take away, I think, our memory, but what he does is he gives us new thoughts, new feelings, new tastes, and new tendencies. So that's been the process. I would say like most things that somebody leaves behind, Mm -hmm. they they, they wanna hang on to you, you know, there's something gonna cling to you like a a limpet or a barnacle clings to the hull of a ship. So I'm really interested to talk to you about how, I don't wanna start at the end, but at some stage I'd like you to talk about how difficult it was extricating yourself from that lifestyle with the right. temptation and the habit patterns and so on and so on and so on. But let's talk about getting into it. You 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 identified you thought you were or you were trans mm-hmm. at a very young age. You were a boy believing that he wanted to be a girl. Right. Yeah. So John, I didn't know the terminology, you know, and this right. was back in the nineteen sixties. You know, I didn't even have the freedom to talk to my parents or people that I trusted about it. It was kind of like this secretive thing because I knew that I got punished every time that I would 
dress up in my mother's or my sister's clothing. I would get punished if I got caught playing with dolls. I was the only boy in a family of six. So, you know, my dad was a musician in the Navy, so he was gone sometimes three to six months at a time. Um, so I was surrounded by femininity. And, and I remember it wasn't until I was in my 40s and as I was searching, I believe that the Lord started to show me that there was a defensive detachment that happened between my father and me. And basically, you know, between the ages of one and three, a child starts to realize that they're either male or female. So again, being surrounded by females, my dad being gone a lot, you know, my dad wasn't available to show me what, you know, masculinity was really sure. about. Yeah. But then when my dad was home, he was abusive and loud and aggressive. So in my subconscious mind, even before I was conscious, which I think was about the ages of three or four, that I must have known that that was my my same sex parent, but because of his aggressive and abusive, you know, example to me, I rejected that. So it was kind of like this defensive detachment, meaning that if that's my identity, no thank you. So again, the only example left for me was my mom. So by the time I was four years old, I was already effeminate. I was already wanting to dress up in, you know, women's clothing and to play with dolls. And I didn't know how that started because all of that, you know, happened even before I was conscious but it became conscious at four years old. Um, I didn't know what the term was for it. I didn't know what the resolution was for it, but I knew that in my mind, I couldn't change my mind. So I thought that my body had to change. A and I didn't even understand that probably until um, much later, like in my teen years, when same-sex attraction started to happen for me about the age of 13, um, I, I knew that God was real. I knew that he existed, but I think that I, transferred my relationship with my father to God, meaning that I didn't obey my father because I loved him, I obeyed him because I feared him. Sure. So the same thing for God, you know, and I always thought that God was just waiting to basically pull the rug out from under me or, you know, to thump me in the head or that he was basically indifferent. So I remember thinking to myself, well, if I already feel like I'm trapped in a you know boy's body and that I should be female, and then homosexuality is an, according to his word, then even in my teen years until I was 20 years old, the thought in my mind was that, well, if I have a sex change, then everything will be okay with God and he'll be all right with me. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the confusion, John, of dealing with that from the time you're four years old until you're 20 years old, even as a Christian, you know, trying to resolve this issue, and yet what was really sad was for all of that time, I can't remember a time when I didn't ever feel alone. Like to me, I even had this strange kind of um, fantasy in my mind that I had this fantasy that if I was a um, twin, that I could actually look at my twin brother to know who I was. So you can see how disconnected I was with my own biology. I, I couldn't even look at myself naked in a mirror because I rejected everything that I saw. Which I, th I think is really interesting. This, this was this, this struggle, this battle, this experience, it was very real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the reason I want to point that out is because it's relatively common now, re re relatively common now, yet it's real. So so young people who struggle with this, they're struggling. Mm -hmm. I mean, someone's going to say, well, there's one kid who's not, and it's all a, all a game, but right. let's be gracious about this. The struggle's real, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And it's a real battle, and, a, and a, it's got to be very confusing. Must be hard for a lot of young people today to be dealing with this. Absolutely, you know, um, I, I, as a matter of fact, I think to myself, if I was living in this day and age, if those laws were available for me when I was six or seven years old, I would have been standing first in line for those hormone blockers, and then by fourteen or fifteen to have you know the surgeries that were that weren't going to give me the sex of a female, but they would maybe give me the appearance of that. They're really nothing more than a mutilation. Yeah. But I would have been completely open to that and would have pursued that until I was 20 years old. Which is really interesting because later on in life, you, you decided you clearly did not want that. What's so it? What, yeah. what would have happened if, if, if early in life you'd done something um, irrevocable mm -hmm. and later in life regretted that? Man, where would that leave you? Well, that's what's happening now. There's a lot of people, and the term is detransition. That's so right. For a person that transitions to the to the, to the opposite sex or the sex that they prefer, um, now there are people that are finding that in their mid twenties that after you know males end up maturing in their late twenties. For women, it's usually mid twenties, 
and that there's a lot of women and men that are saying, wait a minute, what have I done? And these medical communities, these doctors have actually allowed these children to take um, puberty blockers, which actually block the puberty process, where little boys end up growing natural female breasts and their voice doesn't change. And then all of a sudden, at 14 or 15, they have these sex, you know, sex change surgeries. Then all of a sudden, in their early 20s, they realize, wait a minute, I'm not you know, the sex that I was pursuing, that I'm completely comfortable in the biology that I was born into. But now they're um, sterile. They can never reproduce. They're, um, they're never even able to function sexually. And there's a lot of problems that that creates when we allow children to determine what their sex is. It's interesting, um, at 20 years old, this change that happened for me was I basically turned my back on Christianity. I sure. said, I'm done. I can't get my religion and my sexuality to come together. I went to church honestly seeking that maybe there'd be somebody that I could talk to. I, I waited for, for weeks and weeks. I, I would go to church and I would look at the men that were in my church and I would think to myself, who am I going to share my secret with? Because I really wanted to know, you know, God, I've been doing this for 20 years and nothing's really working. So I handpicked this one guy and we sat down and he said, well, Mike, what's up? And I said, well, it has to do with women. And before I could say another word, John, he interrupted me and he said something so degrading about women, I knew I wasn't safe to share my secret. And so, you know, I thanked him for his time. I walked out of church at night and I said to God, if that's the best you've got, I'm out of here. Hey, listen, this raises a really serious question, right? I believe that we have to be really careful how we discuss the LGBTQ issue within the Christian church. I'm so glad you said that. Listen, to stand up and say, it's wrong. I mean, a, a trained monkey can do that. Mm -hmm. Standing up and saying, it's wrong, doesn't really help the 14-year-old or the 18-year-old or the 22-year-old right. who's experiencing a crisis and is looking for some, let's just call it advice. Let's just say they're looking for advice. If we stand up and say, it's wrong, they're all going to hell, what we succeed, the only thing we succeed in doing is driving people away. That's right. So how in the world then mm -hmm. do we portray the idea of God having certain standards, yet we are here for you, we love you, we want to support you, we want to help you? How do you convey that message? Because this is the message that must be conveyed. It's such a simple little thing that I think that we overlook it so much. Um, I've been talking to, to many individuals that are also struggling with their identity or sexuality. And something that they brought up, someone brought up to me just a few weeks ago is he said, I really believe that what's missing in the church is just somebody to listen. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that we think that as Christians that we have to have the answers and that if somebody's struggling with identity or sexuality, you know, we tell them what the Bible says and that should be the end of the discussion. But I think a lot of times we misrepresent the Holy Spirit when we negate the process of relating to the individual from where they're coming from rather than relating to that individual from a from a church sure. perspective. Yeah. And, and I think that we lose a lot when we use words like abomination and sin and things like that, especially for individuals that that have turned their back on God and have gone into that that culture or that lifestyle. They've already been wounded, even by a simple statement. I, I remember um, the pastor said, just in casual conversation, and he said, well, at least I'm not gay. And just that simple phrase, not knowing the audience that he was speaking to, to me, I automatically felt rejected. So mm. it was very easy to walk away from the church culture because even from a simple statement like that, when I wasn't getting any resources or support for somebody that was seeking help and all I got was condemnation and rejection, you know, it makes it very easy for people to walk out of the church. Um, the other thing that you brought up, which I think is really valuable, is a lot of people will say this thing like LGBT, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And even that is dismissive and disrespectful. And as Christians, I, I think that it's really important that we need to be harmless as doves and wise as serpents in the way that we even, you know, speak in generalities. Because if I were to say something like that and somebody would hear that, it would automatically dismiss me right. as a source of information, of objectivity, yeah. of somebody that was loving or even kind. And the, the thing that this person said to me um, that I thought was really valuable and, and the answer to your question was listening. Are we willing to at least sit down and listen? Because even if I sit down and listen to you, I'm not affirming you. 
But I think it's important to understand where somebody is coming from and, and to even just to have an open ear and an open heart to understand what they're dealing with. And what I find beautiful is that, that God didn't ask me to convert you. He just asked me to create an, an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit that's can right. do the converting. That's right, that's right. And so if I'm doing my part right, I, I don't have to tell you, you know, that how you're living is wrong or not according to the Bible. But if I, if I create that atmosphere where you respect me and that I respect you and that you can share with me the things that are going on in your life or the things that are important to you, then I create a relationship. And if I create a relationship, then I can win your confidence. And then when I win your confidence, then I believe that when you ask me, hey, Mike, you know, what do you think about this? What, you know, what does the church believe about this? Then I believe that I've created that relationship and now I have an open door to share that when the Holy Spirit opens up that opportunity. When you dived headlong into a gay lifestyle at the age of 20, mm -hmm. was what, 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 what was the emotion? Relief, excitement, fantastic, or did you kind of just, were you conceding that this is just how you're wired and not necessarily excited, but you just accepted it? What was in your mind? Great, I'm free, this is the real me? It was like wearing a shiny, shiny bottom pair of shoes. And it was like I was standing right at that precipice. I knew it was wrong. I knew that this wasn't, you know, what God wanted. It, it, it was everything that I was fighting against, you know, for the 20 years before that. Even at 17 years, I, I prayed that God would just take me. I, I knew what was coming. I knew that gay rights were actually being promoted um, even back in the early 1980s. And as a circumstance actually presented itself. I actually found a gay bar as I was driving home one night from roller skating. And um, the next week, I remember going there and I was trembling. My whole body was trembling like I was shivering. So why'd you go? Because the curiosity, because of the loneliness, because of the frustration, because of everything that I had not been receiving, I believe from the church and this emptiness that it's interesting. Um, there's a phrase, oh, and it's in uh, Proverbs 27, verse 7, and it says that if you've had a full meal, you don't need dessert. But to somebody who's starving, even something bitter will satisfy. And so if I can't get the love that I need from my father or the love that I needed from the boys in school that called me sissy, queer, little girl, and all of that, the rejection that I experienced, then doesn't it make sense that any kind of acceptance sure. would be more valuable than the loneliness that I was getting? And yeah. I believe... That's the reason that I went that night. What I found is as I went into that, that gay bar, uh, again, as I was shivering and trembling, knowing that I was going somewhere that I knew that I didn't think that I would have the ability to ever return. And it was all of that. There was guilt, there was condemnation, there was excitement, there was freedom. There was this, this amazing feeling like I could now finally uh, demonstrate or experience all of the things that I've been repressing for all those years. Was there a, was there an aspect of, okay, this is who I really am. Here's a little relief. This is who I really am. These are my people. I don't know that it was that conscious for me at that point. Yeah. And, and it, it's interesting. Um, and, and I don't, I'm not even sure that you would understand this, but, um, I was actually raped by my first boyfriend and it, I didn't even realize that until years later, because even the rape was more attention than being ignored for all those years. Mm. And that might be even an odd thing to consider. But um, there was a lot of tenaciousness thinking that, you know, no, no, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do this. And I remember that I had some anxiety when I f moved in with the first guy that I was in a relationship with. And when I moved in, I would have these panic attacks every night at sunset, every night at sunset. And that lasted uh, for almost a year. And then because I ignored that for so long, and eventually it just went away. Interesting, okay. There's so many more questions I wanna ask you, and I sure. believe that, that your testimony will be an encouragement and an and enlightenment to many people who hear of this issue, don't really ever get an opportunity to understand it. My guest is Michael Carducci. We will be back in a moment with more of our conversation, brought to you by It Is Written. You know that at It Is Written, we are serious about the study of the Word of God, and we encourage you to be serious about God's Word also. Well, I want to share with you another way that you can dig deeper into the Word of God, and here it is, itiswritten.study. 
go online to itiswritten.study and you can access the It Is Written Bible Study Guides, 25 in-depth Bible studies that will walk you through the Bible. It's going to be good for you, and it's the sort of thing that you will want to tell somebody else about so that they can dig deeper into the Word of God and come to know the things of the Bible intimately. As you get into the It Is Written online Bible study guides, you'll understand the prophecies of the Bible, the plan of salvation, and more. So don't forget, itiswritten.study. Itiswritten.study. Welcome back to Conversations, brought to you by It Is Written. My guest is Michael Carducci. A moment ago, we were talking about you easing into a gay lifestyle at the age of 20 years of age. You were in that lifestyle for two decades. Mm -hmm. How many of those years were great? I'm just so happy I've made this decision. This is where I belong. This is the real me versus inner turmoil. Give me a percentage of that. 20 years, yeah. what was the feeling in your mind was, Thank, well, okay, you, you were done with God, but right, thank right. whoever that I'm in this right. versus, ah, this just isn't sitting well. You know, there were moments of exhilaration. There of were course. moments of ecstasy. Uh -huh. As long as the party was going on, everything was okay. And that meant alcohol, drugs, sex, you know, whatever the addiction was. Um, but on that night when I didn't connect with somebody, when I wasn't able to connect sexually with someone and I would go home, um, and that was when the reality would hit of the loneliness, the, the despair, and the feelings of inadequacy. And in gay culture, you know, it's not all love and acceptance. Right. There's basically a hierarchy in the gay culture. Explain that, that. Explain that to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, young. If you're young and you have a lot of money, you're like a millionaire in the gay culture. Okay. But if you're over 30, you know, that's getting towards o the end. By the time 30. you're 40, you're washed up. No kidding. Absolutely. Unless you're rich and extremely good looking. Huh. And so everything is a very superficial world. Um, and you know what? I, I, I rode up in the ranks, not because I was good looking or rich. Um, I was a hairdresser and an aerobics instructor and... That's as gay as you can get I was in my say, understanding. You, you yeah. checked some boxes there, yes, man. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I, um, I had a boyfriend that was uh, a millionaire, good looking. We both had convertible Mercedes. I was doing hair for television people at NBC and CBS. Um, I had created this world that I thought was, you know, at, I always knew that, that it was going to be fleeting and quick. Oh, yeah. Um, because I'd rejected God and I knew that there was no way that God would ever take me back, nor did I want him back. And so I thought to myself, you know what? I better have as good a time as I can in this life because I knew that, you know, eventually it was going to come to a, a screeching halt. As a matter of fact, I came out the very same year that AIDS came out. Mm. And, you know, I had unprotected sex with men that we'd be dead three months later. And yet that wasn't enough to stop my addictive drive. Yeah, I, I, I want to ask you about that. Yeah. Because, um, gay men were dropping like flies during the, the tragedy of the AIDS right. epidemic. They didn't even just, have a word for it. No, that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And so you were immersed in the gay community as the gay community was wrestling with this. Right. So mm -hmm. you lost friends. Absolutely. Undoubtedly. I, I, yeah. I expect everybody, everybody, right. you know, there's so much death going on with AIDS. What what did that do to the to the gay community? It, it didn't shake people, or maybe it shook some, but it didn't shake you Right. Out, of, out of the lifestyle or, or did right. you make any significant changes the way you were living or, or what? Not at all. Um, wow. As a matter of fact, uh, I would say that in my first relationship, I was introduced to sexual things that I never even thought of before. And that was when the sexual addiction really became um, strongest probably uh -huh. for me. And then, you know, from that point on, uh, the acting out was you know, the promiscuity in the gay community is huge. I want to ask you about that because, you know, we talk about gay marriages. It's mm -hmm. just just, just two, two nice guys living together happily right. ever after, holding hands as they walk along the beach in the evening and so forth. It's not the same. The, 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 the gay culture, and someone mm -hmm. maybe with good reason will take exception to what I'm about to ask you, but it appears that there's a really heavy emphasis mm -hmm. on sex. Mm -hmm on the physical side of mm -hmm. being gay. I don't want to say more than the emotional. Someone's going to say, hey, that's true for heterosexuals as well. But it does seem mm -hmm. from, from what some of the literature says that homosexuals can be famously promiscuous. So what's that all about? 
Well, according to the statistics, it is different than heterosexual culture. Um, the lesbian culture tends to be less sexually active, but still more than the heterosexual community. Um, I know that in, in the gay community that promiscuity is extremely rampant and that's the expectation. But I do believe that there are, you know, some people that don't identify with the bar scene, sure, sure. you know, no, that yeah, they no, might yeah. be in a committed relationship. But um, for the most part, I think the statistics are very clear that, that promiscuity and um, STDs as well as drug and alcohol addiction are highest among the gay community. Do you have any in, in, insight as to why that might be? Because it's a sad thing, right? Well, you know something, I like I was always trying to create life as this big party and um, I would say that I was probably mildly alcoholic, but again, my addiction was really sex. So the alcohol had to play a minimal part because of my, my other addiction, which was the strongest. But there is a lot of uh, drugs and alcohol that was in that in that culture, but I was just kind of swept up in in all of that as well. Um, yeah, I, I think that I, I think that there is some truth to the fact that you know people that end up in sexual addiction or end up in in that culture where you're not able to express that openly or freely. I, I think that there might be a sliver of a percentage of you know rejection of culture or not acceptance in that culture. I remember that um, I was working in a hospital one time and one of the doctors came in and there was a gentleman who was probably 18 years old and I was already 23 and definitely sexually addicted. And we were standing there in gowns and we were, we were all like covered up and our shoes were covered and we we're wearing a mask and we had goggles on because at that point they thought that AIDS was airborne. Uh -huh, sure. and, I, and I remember this doctor and it was on a psych unit and I remember this doctor just berating this depressed, suicidal 18 year old young man because he was HIV positive. And he said, you're not gonna spread your disease uh -huh. around my hospital and as I'm standing there as a, you know, as a staff member thinking to myself, if that doctor only knew, you know, yep. what my behavior was yep, like. Sure. And yet, even though this, this disease was, was taking out, you know, men at an alarming rate, alarming rate. it was never enough to stop my my addictive behavior. And that's the power of addiction, I suppose. Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. yeah. So there you were, 20 years practicing homosexual. Mm -hmm. Somehow though, some lights came on mm -hmm. and you decided you wanted out. No, no, not at all. Were you, drag, you were dragged out kicking and screaming? How, how'd this happen? Somewhere in between, somewhere oh, yeah? in between. and. And honestly, I, I was at the top of my game. I, I had, like I said, television. My best friends were in television. My boyfriend was rich. We, you know, driving these expensive cars. I had a condo on a lake. I had a house with a pool. You know, I had everything that the world said was valuable. And, but I had three sisters that were praying for me in the sidelines. Yeah. And, and in my salon, my boyfriend and I had a shop together. We had nine hairdressers. And my sister was my assistant. And my sister was the closest to a Christ-like example for me. Um, you know what? My sister loved me. Yeah. And and she would always invite my my lovers and I over for holidays. She never stopped me from interacting with her son. You know, my nephew. And she was as loving and kind to all of the other homosexual hairdressers in my salon as much as she was to me. I just thought that she was okay with it. I just assumed that she was all right with it. But secretly, with my other sister, she was praying for me. And through a series of events, um, she just, there was something that was happening. And uh, I had gone to my other sister's wedding where she remarried her ex-husband. And I was really upset by that. But the Holy Spirit really spoke to me through this man that I hated. So my brother-in-law had come back. My sister and him had reunited. I thought she was an idiot. I thought that Christianity was really a place for fools to hide, you know, that people that were weak. And so as I was sitting there, he made this open confession about how he had been unfaithful to his wife, how he had been, you know, this, this, you know, he didn't pay any child support or, you know, thank the church for taking care of his family. And as he made this full confession before he was baptized, I remember these tears coming down my face and thinking to myself, that is not that man that I hate. Like I, hmm. I saw a transformation yeah. that the Holy Spirit was doing through him. And, 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 after that, when I went back to Florida, my sister in Florida, the Lord said, invite your brother to an evangelistic series. And in my sister's mind, she thought, he'll never go. But she obeyed and she said, hey, there's an evangelistic series going on in a tent, dirt floor, folding chairs, do you wanna go? And 
Of course, I didn't want to go. I was, you know, too highbrow for that. But, but the Lord was working on my heart, and I agreed to go. And within two months, um, I was I was sitting there in the chair. It was the last night of the evangelistic series. I'd just gotten back from ten day vacation with my boyfriend, and as I'm sitting there, the preacher made this altar call, and he said, "For some of you tonight, this will be it. This is you'll never hear the Holy Spirit again, and your probation will close, and you'll never have another opportunity." to accept Jesus into your heart. And as I was sitting there, I was under such conviction, you know, here I had this boyfriend who I loved, and I have the sexual addiction that he didn't even know about. And and I said to God, I said, Lord, I give you my heart, but I can't go up there. I knew that there was no way that I deserved to go up there. And honestly, John, my next conscious thought, I was standing in front, wow. and my sister was weeping beside me. And and I believe that an angel got on either side of me once I said, I give you my heart, Lord. And next thing I knew, I was up there. Now, my sister in the parking lot that night, she said, so what are you going to do about your boyfriend? And I said, nothing, I'm gay. And I was being sincere. And literally, I said to her, I said, I pray that God would change me. That never happened. And I said, all I know is that Jesus loves me for who I am. And, and that was the only truth that I had. I, the truth that I knew was that Jesus did love me for who I was. And my sister never said another word. And the next morning, I was baptized with a boyfriend and a sexual addiction. And I didn't come up out of that water, you know, ready to date women and to get married. I was still struggling with all the things that I struggled with before I went into that water. But God was beginning a very messy journey with me. And as I was walking with Jesus Christ, He was revealing Himself to me in ways that I had never experienced ever before. And you know, my boyfriend, when he found out that I was a baptized member of the church, and he was like, are you kidding? You know, and I was kind of, you know, surprised myself. And in my mind, I thought to myself, well, if, if God would just baptize my boyfriend, we could be this mighty team for God. And I know that God winked at that. And eventually, as I was, you know, walking this out with Jesus, and honestly, those two questions were first and foremost in my mind. Why was I transgender at four? Why was I gay at 13? Yeah. And I thought that there was no way that God would change me, and I didn't want to change. But I was hopeful that that God was going to show me that this was okay because I was experiencing His love, John, in a way that I'd never experienced anyone's love before. And what was amazing is about three months later, I was really frustrated and I was really angry. And because I was reading that, you know, God does not approve of same-sex couples, you know. And I got really angry, and I, and I said, if you want me out of that relationship, you're going to have to do it yourself. And within a couple of weeks, my boyfriend broke up with me. Oh. And this peace came over me, and I knew that God had spoken, and I knew that God was taking me out of that relationship, but I still wasn't straight. Yeah, I'm going to ask you, so the Lord orchestrated circumstances, so you're yep. no longer in that relationship, right. but you're still homosexual. Right. With all the attractions and the addiction and yep. all that sort of a thing. So, yep. so you may not have a boyfriend, but I mean... That right. doesn't necessarily stop you from doing right. much. So it wasn't so much as an event as I think of it as a process. Sure, sure. And it's when a process, I think of, yeah. you know, Mary Magdalene had to be healed of demons seven times. Sure. You know, Haman had to dip into the river seven times to be healed. So I think that we do a disservice to some people when when we tell them that, oh, when you get baptized, that everything is wiped away and you're finished. I think the realization that when you're beginning that G that journey with Jesus Christ. He really started to address the emptiness, the loneliness, the pain, the suffering. And, and this is interesting, John, because I don't know that I would ever share this before or, or, you know, in public or whatever. But remember that little boy at four years old? Mm. Every relationship that I was in, I was always trying to recreate that they would know everything that I felt. Like that four-year-old boy, when I was six years old, being taunted by the boys, when I was teased, when I was going to this inner city school and I was the only you know white kid there and I'd get beat up if I didn't get beat up at, at home by my sister, I got beat up on the bus. And I was always trying to make every boyfriend or every relationship to know exactly everything that I went through. And it wasn't until years after I'd been walking with Jesus Christ that one day he said to me, he said, Mike, I'm the one that knows everything that happened to yeah. you. I know what happened to that little boy. I know the rejection that you experienced from your dad. I know the rejection you got from school. I know every illicit situation that you've encountered in the last 20 years in that lifestyle. He said, I'm the one you've been seeking for because I know what you've been through. Mm. Going straight mm -hmm. had to have been hard. 
difficult. I don't know that it was ever a pursuit as much as it was, was an experience. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but that experience. I mean, look, yeah. the, 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 okay, some people, God takes alcohol away, takes yeah. cigarettes away, takes anger away, but many right. people, you know, that's a, you kind of got to claw through that leaning on Jesus bit by bit. How difficult was that to emerge from that lifestyle as, you know, you, you're a Christian and yeah. you, you, you're struggling and you're a Christian and you, that process, what was that like? It was a huge struggle. I, I started to meet other individuals that were like me. You know, we were in the church and we had one foot in, one foot out. You know, is this really something we're going to commit to? Can God really change us? Does God have a magic wand that he can just, you know, you know, hit us with this magic wand and everything is, is gone for our convenience? And as I was meeting with these men, I saw a testimony of a man that was also transgender and gay. Uh, he was molested as a little boy, and um, and he ended up giving his heart to the Lord after he was living as a woman for a year and a half, and he was still very effeminate, John. And as I looked at his testimony, at first I was really disgusted, and yet as I listened to his testimony and he started to talk about the power of Jesus Christ in his life again, I was weeping by the end of his testimony, and he's married now and has children and a, and a grandparent. And I remember looking at him and thinking to myself, well, if God can do that for him, then he can do that for me. Yeah. And that was fairly early on still in my walk. And, you know, it's been 23 years. I'm not married. I'm not dating. But what I found is that is that my relationship with Jesus Christ has satisfied more than any relationship I've ever sure. experienced before. Yeah. And how is it that a God that I can't see or that I can't touch or I can't feel his touch, how is it that he's more valuable and satisfies me more than the relationship that I did experience, that I could touch, that I could feel. And you know what? I don't have an explanation for that. But you know what? That's what keeps me in the game. And I still have same-sex attraction. But yet about 14, 15 years ago, I had a first situation where I had my first attraction to the opposite sex. So, mm. you know, imagine going through puberty in your, your 40s and 50s. But, um, you know, I'm not necessarily where I want to be but I'm also not where I used to be. And I- That's very I, honest. Yeah, yeah. And I, I wouldn't identify in that culture or in that life because my direction now, my focus, my, um, my orientation is really to be like Christ. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm interested, I've got to ask you about this, the, the convertible Mercedes and the lake house and yeah. all of that. When you came out of the gay lifestyle, did, did, I mean, did you lose some of that? Oh, he, had, yeah. he had the high profile job dealing with celebrities left and right. What happened to that guy? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, what's interesting because like I said, you know, my boyfriend and I broke up and and then through some other convictions, I really felt like I needed to uh, end the business relationship. And, and this is interesting because uh, at one point, you know, the salon had my name on it. My boyfriend ran radio stations and he was my business partner and so this was my career. This was my dream to have my my salon with my shop, and and it took about six months of pleading with my ex, and finally he bought me out for a very small amount of my investment in the shop. But you know what? It's interesting because we actually hired his boyfriend, his new boyfriend, in the shop that was mine. And after he bought me out of my shop, here I was working for a year and a half for my ex lover's new boyfriend oh, wow. in my salon. Yeah. Oh, that's gotta be that's no, gotta no. be tough, man. I needed it. I needed oh, yeah? it. Yeah, every single day, you know, when I would run into the bathroom and drop to my knees and pray, you know, it was another opportunity to really humble myself and to realize, you know, what it was that I wanted. And when I when I saw my ex and his boyfriend living the life that we were living, yeah. there were times when it really pulled, you know, on my emotions. And the and Jesus would always say, Mike, if you want that, you can have that. Interesting. Bible says that everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Right. And 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 as tempting as that was, and the friends and the life that you know that went with that, um, it was still amazing that I I had to make a decision. Did I want the life or did I want my my savior? Yeah. And I praise God that each and every time that he proved to me that he was not only enough, but more. He was more satisfying. In a moment, I want to ask you about prayer. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about science, mm -hmm. because if all this is your opinion, I mean, everyone's opinion's worth about just as much, but I know that sure. you base a lot of, all of what you talk about on science, and I'll ask you about ministry. We'll do that in a moment. With Michael Carducci, I am John Bradshaw. More of our conversation in just a moment, brought to you by It Is Written. Mm -hmm. 
more and more people are watching It Is Written TV. They're watching their favorite It Is Written programs, listening to inspiring sermon series, and much more. They're watching them here, here, and even here. See for yourself why people are turning to It Is Written TV to watch their favorite Christian programs live and on demand. Watch It Is Written TV for free anytime on Roku, Apple TV, and at itiswritten.tv. Planning for your financial future is a vital aspect of Christian stewardship. For this reason, It Is Written is pleased to offer free planned giving and estate services. For information on how we can help you, please call 800-992-2219. Call today or visit our website, hislegacy.com. Call 800-992-2219. Welcome back to Conversations brought to you by It Is Written. My guest is Michael Carducci. Michael, I want to touch on something. I think it's really important when you're talking about transgender issues, gay sure. issues, the, the entire LGBTQ movement and people's experience. We, we, I think, must relate to that with respect. Their experience is real, man. You know, people are doing stuff. These aren't people acting and playing a game. Mm -hmm. It's real stuff. Now, you've spoken about a and B and C and D and E as we've talked. You do a lot of this. You speak to individuals and audiences all around the world. Mm -hmm. How scientific are you? Are you? It's one thing for a, for a man to stand up and say, this is my experience, and you've got to respect that. Right. But where's the science? And where does the science come into what you talk about? You know, the science was real important to me also in my own journey. And what I found is I, you know, my presentations are based on statistics that are, you know, that have been done and, and, you know, also life experience. And, and what I found as far as the transgender issue goes is that, um, you know, there's a movement now we have like over 80% of young people that are really struggling. I know it's like 60 some percent of girls and 30 some percent of boys are now struggling with gender identity issues. So how is it that all of a sudden we have these huge numbers yeah. and where did that come from? Yeah, and I believe that that's from the media. So, and you just answered the question, you think media? Absolutely, yeah. yeah, without a doubt. There's a lot of popular musicians and actors that are now transitioning from the sex that they were biologically born into. And because it's being so promoted and accepted in in culture that now our young people are growing up with this and and they're exploring it or it's putting ideas in their minds that, that otherwise wouldn't have been there. I, I believe that what's happening is that that as those boundaries between, you know, the sexes are coming yes. down, that yes. there's a um a mixing of that, if you will. Wouldn't wouldn't gay folks or transgender people say, well, that's as it should be? Because, you know, when I was a kid, this was taboo. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm not a kid, it's not taboo. Take the taboo <laughs> away. Does that drive someone to where they ordinarily wouldn't be? Mm -hmm. Or does it give them permission to go where they otherwise would be? Absolutely. And uh, there was a, a situation where they... Um, they found that in Afghanistan that there were there were boys that were being kidnapped and they were prepubescent or they were pubescent boys and these boys were uh, repeatedly sexualized or sodomized and then they were trained to be prostitutes they were male prostitutes and so they did an interview with these um, these young men and they asked them they said were you gay and many of the men said no I was never gay I even had a girlfriend at the time that they were you know that they were kidnapped or you know, and, and brought into that, that um, profession. But they said that, you know what, after repeated, you know, uh, sexualization, that, that the behavior was no big deal. So I think that what's happening is we're seeing that as those boundaries are coming down, that there's a lot of experimentation and, and people in school or, you know, in their homes that never would have experimented before, now they're starting to experiment, and when you experience it, it starts to awaken a sexuality or an identity that, that otherwise wouldn't have been there necessarily. What do you think the role of pornography might be in that? Huge, absolutely huge. Um, I know that when I was 17 years old, I was cleaning my father's offices, and I found my father's pornography, and I was using um, my father's pornography, and I knew that he was, and um, it's interesting, Ted Bundy was interviewed the night before he was put to death and mm -hmm. Ted Bundy was a serial killer. Yeah. And they asked him, they said, what was it that made you such an animal? And his answer was pornography was the beginning of that. 
and he said that the pornography eventually wasn't enough and he needed more and more stimulation and he said and eventually it led to where he was uh you know a serial killer and yeah. also a necrophiliac and he said this which i believe has a uh, uh definitely you know relevance to our world today is he said if pornography becomes more and more relevant he said you'll see more people like me interesting isn't it yeah absolutely so there was a um video I was watching and it was called um, Raised on Porn and in this video it was a 16 year old couple male and female and this young boy or this young man was so experienced with violent pornography from the time that he was a young boy that in a situation with his girlfriend he said to her he said you know one time while we're making love he said I'm just gonna punch you in the nose because I want to see what it's like for your nose to bleed you know while we're making love and she said yeah. no you're not and he said, no, no, you, you won't even see it coming. And, and what was so sad or what was so, uh, I think, obvious about that situation is he had been so anesthetized to violent porn for so long that he really, even though he loved you know, his partner, that he saw her as, as something to be used for his sexual gratification yeah. and that it was so distorted that he thought that even violence in the middle of sex would be acceptable to her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It distorted, I uh -huh. think, is the word. And and unfortunately, precious few people really appreciate the distortions mm -hmm. that, that pornography brings right. along. You transitioned into ministry somewhere along the, mm -hmm. along the way. Mm -hmm. How in the world did you, did you ever imagine that would happen? Did you see it coming? How did you, you so, so you, you're gay, you're straight, now ministry. Tell us how that came about. So in retrospect, I can see how God was, was guiding me along that way. I, um, I moved to Tennessee from Florida. I spent 10 years in the country and it was amazing, the opportunities and, and the, op the things that I was experiencing from God on an intimate level. And, and here what I, here's what I think is, is a really valuable thing for a lot of people because it's not a gay or straight thing, but I believe that anyone that is sexually compromised, that what it does is it destroys intimacy. And you know, because of my sexual addiction, I, I had looked at people as, as objects for my own fulfillment. And so I didn't care about how they felt or who they were or that they had any value, you know, other than how they could satisfy me. And what I believe is that in the 23 years that I've been walking with the Lord now, He's restoring that intimacy that was broken between Him and me so that I can also see that intimacy or that ability in other people or value in yeah, other people. Yeah. And so it took a while. I was, you know, probably in my desert experience for about 10 years. And I got an invitation to give a 10 minute testimony at a university. And I wrote it down and I read it. And from that moment on, the Lord um, started to give me more and more opportunities to speak. I, I want to come back to that, but you said sure. something that I want to pick up on. You said it took a while. Mm -hmm. So you got an 18 year old kid really struggling with same sex attraction. Mm -hmm or it might be a 30-year-old woman. Mm -hmm. She's struggling with same-sex attraction. Um, you can't just snap your fingers and have this gone. So what do you say to that person who's, who even has turned to God right. and they're wrestling with this thing and they want it gone? Because so often, you know, I'm, I'm 19 years old. I've been praying for five years mm -hmm. that this would go away. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it, it takes a while. Doesn't, is it fair to say that? Yeah. Now, maybe sometimes God delivers somebody instantaneously, but with addiction, it frequently doesn't work like that. And with same-sex attraction, we are dealing with the deep, deep, deep wiring way back there. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it wise or appropriate or fair or whatever to advise someone to be patient as you allow God to work this out? W would you, what would you say about that? I think so. I think Matthew 6, 33, is a perfect example and it's not a gay thing or a straight thing. That's right. It, it's really a sin thing and it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I was just in a conversation with a transgender female, is someone who's biologically male, and then this lesbian woman that kept saying, you know, I'm a lesbian, I'm a lesbian. I said, okay, you're a lesbian, I get it. I said, but Matthew 6, says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You do those two things, and everything will fall right into place. And yeah. for the transgender person, they were saying, you know, if I could just have a sex change, if I could just, you know, have this, my life would be perfect. And so, you know what? The focus, if we put it back in its proper perspective, 
and it has an application for all of us, John. It's not a, like I said, it, it, it isn't just the answer or the protocol for somebody gay or the protocol for a drug addict or the protocol for you know somebody that's addicted to porn. But if you put the focus on Christ and his righteousness, then everything falls right into place. Yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful thing. And I think it's fair to say, right, things don't always fall into place immediately. Maybe a relationship with God will, sure. but in your experience, it took you some time even to extricate yourself from that lifestyle. Your eyes were on Jesus. You were growing, 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 growing. Yeah. It's really important, I think, to encourage people by saying, don't expect your same-sex attraction to disappear in a nanosecond. Mm. It just may not, but keep on looking to Jesus, right? Right, and somebody gave me this um, object lesson, and they were talking about, as it is with the physical, so it is with the spiritual. And they gave the demonstration that, you know, if somebody had, you know, a huge wound, and then, you know, there was an infection in it, but it healed on the outside, but the infection was still on the inside. Yeah, sure. And there was a lot of things that happened to to me as that little child that rejected my father even before I was conscious. And, you know, the wounds that I've experienced, you know, from the boys in school and even the illicit lovers that I had for those 20 years. So when I began that journey again at 40 with Jesus Christ, I believe that what he did is he had to go back in and he had to cut open this wound that had healed shut because there was an infection in there and the infection hadn't gone away. And as he was cleaning out the infection, he had to watch it carefully and to allow it to grow to heal from the inside to the out yeah. so that I would never struggle with that again. And I believe that that's a process that I've been in for the last 20 years. What I love about Jesus is that he never takes me further than I can do, than I can go. And of course, he could take it all away magically for my convenience, but I wouldn't learn to depend on him. And John, I have to depend on him like I breathe air. That's right. You know, the thoughts and the feelings, the history and the memory that I, many of us that deal with. You're no different than anybody else nope. in that respect. No, I'm maybe, not. Maybe it's just that your experience has, has really made that vivid for you. So many other people uh, don't take it quite that seriously. They have to look for, to Jesus for every every breath mm -hmm. and every thought and every beat of our heart. Right. You represent Coming Out Ministries. What's Coming Out Ministries all about? Coming Out Ministries, I believe, is really um, <clears throat> talking about sexual integrity. Uh, we realized early on in our ministry that while all of us came out of the LGBT life, uh, people come up to us and they said, I was never gay, but everything that you've said really relates to my own personal experience. Sure. And what was beautiful is that we thought, oh, okay, we're not so unique and we're not so different. But what it also did is it let me know that we are all struggling and that our ministry is not an ex-gay ministry. It's really about connecting people back to the power of Jesus Christ to transform their life. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think about 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and, and verses 9 and 10, it talks about all the abominations that won't be in heaven. And yes, homosexual practice is one of those. And it's also included with the fornicator, the adulterer, the licentious, the liar, you know, the murderer and the gossiper. So we're all in this together. And and so it's we don't want to make anyone exclusive. If we make one group of, of people exclusive from that, then we cut them off from verse 11. It says, such were some and of such you. Such were some of you. But what you've been washed. Verse. You've been justified. You've been sanctified yeah. by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Verse 11, none of us can do, John. That's the power of That's what right. Jesus did on the cross. Yeah. And when he rose from the dead, he now has the ability to justify me immediately and that work of sanctification. And we don't want to cut off anyone. So if we if we make homosexuality exclusive out of that group, right. which we did 50 years ago, and we said that God hates them and gays can't change. And now what's happening in the church is like, now we've still made that group exclusive saying they still can't change and th that God loves them. And if you tell them they can, they can change that that's hate speech, when really what you've done is you've made this group of people exclusive and you've cut them off from the transforming power of what Jesus did on the cross. And in 2 Timothy 3 verse 5, it says, there's a group of people that have a form of godliness. Denying the power. But they own. deny the power. And that power is what Jesus did on the cross. And if you deny that Jesus can't change you, or Jesus can't help you from all the things that are written in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, then we have cut people off from the power and the intimate connection of Jesus Christ that he wants. It's with each sort of us. understandable why. It's sort of understandable why. But isn't it un a little bit unfortunate, or maybe grossly unfortunate, mm -hmm that the church, and I mean that in the very general sense, has taken homosexuality and elevated that, like that is the gold medal sin. Yeah. And everything else after that is merely a certificate of participation. That's the one, that and abortion and, and uh, child sexual abuse. Yep. Th those are the three that are way up there. 
everything else, you know, we, we, can, we can be reasonable about. Right. Is, are we, is that going to change? I think that the church's attitude about those specific issues has been the reason why the gay community has done so well because we have cut them off. We said that they can't change. And I think that was the gay community that said, okay, well, if you say we can't change, we want marriage, we want our own rights, we want to be acknowledged. And, and so I think that the Christian community has done a lot for the, for the, for the message of the gay community. Yeah. But I believe that the problem is that, that when we make groups of people exclusive from, from that group, again, we're denying them access to an intimate relationship with Christ. And that's what's been the difference for me. You know, in this process, and, and I wish that somebody would have let me know that, that, you know, God doesn't necessarily take away our history and our memory. Right. But what I've also found is I found community with other people that they didn't struggle with homosexuality or maybe even, you know, sex addiction or whatever. But, you know, I have friends that are married and they say, just because I got married doesn't mean that I don't see beautiful women, you know, and that they struggle also with thoughts and, and, and these, you know, things that are in their mind too. And so we're all in this together. And, and, and I believe that, that the process isn't this magical disappearing of the history, but I think that it's really, um, it's the power of Jesus Christ to take those thoughts and to give us new thoughts and new feelings yes. and new tastes and new tendencies. And that, that's what the gospel does, right? Amen. The gospel contemplates our complete recovery from the power of sin. That's right. Whatever, whatever your sin. That's right. We've only got about 90 seconds. Okay. So I want to ask you a question that we could have done a whole program on. All right. You mentioned you had a sister who was praying for you. Yes. The power of prayer. Mm. Yeah. Mm. What about that? Absolutely. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for their prayers. And, and when I give my testimony, I, I ask the audience, if you, if you hear nothing more, just remember that it might, if my sisters believed in this, this new ideology in the church that, that God's okay with gay, they would have stopped praying for me and there would have been no hope for me. But I praise God that they didn't buy into that and that they held on to the, the principle that God can save us from anything. And because of their prayers, I believe that that's why God gave me another chance. Yeah, so we just, ought to be, whatever someone's wrestling with, yeah. whatever yeah. their life looks like, yeah. got to pray, right? Just got to pray. You got to keep on praying. Absolutely. Because God, the God who was able then is still able today. That's right. And there's power in the gospel, power in his word. And, and great power and prayer. Hey, thanks. This has been fun. I've really enjoyed speaking yeah, with you. Yeah, me too. <laughs> wish you all the very best. Thank I, you. I wish for you much busyness and great activity, n not to breaking point, but in uh, ministry so that you can uh, share the power of Jesus with um, with people wherever you go. Thank you. Great fun. Thank Appreciate you for this much. opportunity. Yeah, 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 yeah. And thank you. It's been a real joy having you with us. I hope that you've been encouraged or blessed. I hope that you take away from this an idea, the idea and understanding that God is able. There are times, and I think both of us know this, don't we, that you, you might know somebody who's stuck somewhere in their experience and you say, put that one in the too hard basket. No one, no person is too hard, unreachable, uh, owing to the power of the Holy Spirit. With Michael Carducci, I'm John Bradshaw. This has been our conversation. <laughs> <laughs>